Don't just stay dry. Stay super dry. With super dry deodorant. Extra TV with special guest, man. True hip hop pioneer, Grand Mixer DXT. How are you, sir? I'm good. And you? Uh, better now, son. <laughs> have one of our idols and pioneers here. Uh, first of all, first things first. Uh, very for those that may not understand the difference between the context DST and DXT, would you please explain the deviation from which? Well. <clears throat> To really, truly answer that question would probably take up the entire tape. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to try to give you a synopsis of it. I, I changed my name from S to X in 1990. Uh, my, I had an older brother who was murdered in 1989, and I went through a lot of changes. And part of that was to the changes I went through. I had to uh, go through a process of, of rebirth and being born again in certain ways consciously. And mm. in that process, I changed the S to an X. I understand. Um, and I also realize this stuff that may uh, have a lot of, have a lot to do with the influx and the influence and stuff of the almighty universal Zulu nature. And those that may not necessarily know, would you please express to them some of the profound impact that the nation had on our culture and that our young people and stuff to instill some sense of enrichment in those within us to be better people? Well, in the early 70s, you know, we, we were in the, in the whole gang environment, you know, and uh, I remember in the, I think it was the late 60s, actually maybe 69 or 70, uh, I saw West Side Story for the first time, and that was my introduction to gangs. I didn't realize there was gangs outside. Mm until the very next day, believe it or not, the very next day I went to school and everyone was talking about gangs. Now, whether or not the, the, uh, the film had impacted, the, you know, just the mindset of the kids to express that, but it, it became obvious to me. I think, it, you know, I just was not, my orientation was not in the place where I was conscious to gang activity and I didn't see it. I saw bad kids and good kids. I didn't see organized bad kids, <laughs> organized good kids. So uh, we were in the, in, the, in the middle of the gang uh, movement in, uh, in the Bronx. And um, we also, you know, I had older, older siblings. I'm the youngest of four. So, you know, my, my older sister had you know, she was already involved and in, in interested in certain things uh, that was more militant than, uh, you know, just a normal child. So I was exposed to uh, things like the Black Panthers and, and uh, uh, I, I heard about the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X and stuff like that. So there, there were these things, but we didn't directly connect. I was too young mm. to really connect to it and to really overstand what it was. But when I met Africa Bambata in, uh, again, in the world, it had to be 74, 75. He had just moved to Mark Terrace. Um, the key thing to Africa Bambata was the word Africa. And so that, that, that word brought Africa to our consciousness. And from that point, we begin to think about these things. And then we can relate those rhythms the African rhythms that we were completely disconnected from, but for some strange reason still connected to it when we heard it. Uh, and so just by the word Africa and listening to those African rhythms uh, began to transcend our consciousness to, uh, to another level of thinking, and which reconnected us 
to have a better understanding of the Nation of Islam and all of these other uh, uh, organizations that represented uplifting uh, people in our community. I think that, uh, you know, the Zulu Nation, um, you know, just every aspect of it, just the, the words, you know, the Zulus and the Shaka Zulus, you had to think about the origins of, of those things, which helped all of us grow and, and, and uh, began to reconnect us to who we actually are. And that was a key thing um, in the Bronx because it began to transcend the gang. transcend the gangs uh, into, you know, uh, Zulus. You know? <laughs> and so even though we never met an actual Zulu in our life, mm -hmm. even though we never visited South Africa, and but we knew that Zulu was an African word, we knew that Africa, you know, was, was the origin of our, our genetic, you know, and our bloodline, and we was able to reconnect and even from the gangs like i said began to transcend into that way of thinking um which enabled us to become aware of like five percent nation mm. and nation of islam and you know the mau maus and all of these other different organizations again so the zulu nation was a key in in consciousness so that that's one of the geniuses of Africa Bambada, even to think that way, because when, when we first heard his name, we, we were all already conditioned in a, from a Western point of view. So we, Africa Bambada, like what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the average thought process of a person that's gone through the orientation that you go through in this country, especially back at that time. So, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a process that helped stimulate thought and, and it raised consciousness and all of this. Mm -hmm. I was glad you were able to um, emphasize that because, um, I mean, back in those times, even speaking with, you know, the late Brother Guru and everything about the same matter when he was on the guest on the show last year and everything. So there was what, as you speak of, just spoke of a glorious time in hip hop where we were mu we were of a much more culpable mind state. We had a more greater sense of understanding and consciousness and everything and how much that was integral into hip hop and even in what we done in the culture, whether if it was, if you was an MC, you had to be able to prioritize the context of what you were talking about as far as on the mic, but there was certain protocol in order to be, be able to qualify, to touch the mic. You had to earn the DJ's respect. You had to see the DJ and the DJ was more so he ran the show. Would you please a emphasize that? Absolutely. You know, um, back then we didn't even call what's called hip hop hip hop. Mm -hmm. You know, we referred to it as B beat music. Mm -hmm. And um, when we were playing the B beats, you know, and that's what we called it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was critical uh, for every real hip hop DJ to not only have his, have the, the, the standards 
of the music, but then he had to have his own collection of obscure beats. Yes. Uh, which, be, which was, was almost sacred, you know, to <laughs> each group, you know, to the point that we would soak off the labels and switch the album covers so that no one could find it. Because y your, your uh, clientele and your following was really based on not only just the, the, the standards, but your obscure collection. Wait, go ahead. Yeah. Well, what I want you to do is just. Okay. Okay. Do me a favor. Give me a dry run, Dave. Walk through. Coming in right now. Hey, Dave. Will you call Manito? Ah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, Dave. Yes. You tapped it, didn't you? <laughs> All right, um, take a couple steps back, because you're... Hold on, no, no, no. Go ahead. Wow. Oh, wait, wait, there's yeah. someone on the other side of that. No, I'll take it off. Oh, go ahead, bro. No problem. Yeah. Now you guys got me over here in panic. I don't want to smear it at all. Somebody don't worry, man, I'll get it. Don't worry. You sure? Yeah, man, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> we got plenty of cleaning products around here. All right, I'm ready. Three, two. Wait, stop, Doc, you're in my goddamn shot. <laughs> <laughs> Always in the shot, man. Looking for me. Dude, you're in the fucking mirror. <laughs> All right, <laughs> come on. Hey, Debo, you call for me, Manito? Yeah, man. What's this? Hey, I never leave home without him, my yeah, man. You see why this is my man. He's always yeah. there. Give me that, man. I don't want nobody to come Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any money to buy turntables and nothing. Most of the kids who had turntables, you know, they were like, they weren't poor. You know, the turntables was like like yeah. sixty dollars for a pair, one turntable. That's like was expensive mm -hmm. at the time. Two hundred something now. Yeah. So um, it took me a minute. Um, I, I got my first turntable. After my, you know, one of my closest friends, I consider a brother, uh, Mr. C, who, uh, he, all, all my flyers, you see Mr. C production. <laughs> um, he got me a job at McDonald's. And uh, after saving up enough money from McDonald's, because even working at McDonald's, you can't just go out and buy a turntable. Nope. It takes, it takes several months. Not at months that time. To, you know, yeah, Not at 335. Yeah, it takes several months to, with a job at McDonald's yeah. to, to buy. So, I'm with you. <laughs> so I finally bought one turntable and a uh, 1200. No, not 1200. Uh, uh, B1? No, nope, SL210. Oh, and I God. bought that turntable because I couldn't get the 1100 A's that Herc had. Mm -hmm. And I noticed Flash and Bam mm -hmm. had uh, uh, SL210s. Mm. And so that's what I went with that guy. And I had that one turntable and I would take it out the box, set it up, plug it in, turn it on, no head shell, no cartridge, no needle, just turn it on, let it spin, and just stare at it. Mm. I would do that for hours and hours and just think. I would just think and think and then finally, I got uh, my mixer. Got this it. was a Gemini 